let's now travel to South Africa. Academic research is relatively new in many African countries. Instead of copying established systems, scientists are working to design new ones, seizing the opportunity to develop new strategies for open research. Many challenges shape this research at a continent-wide level and also for each individual country, but groundbreaking work is underway. Our next speaker leads H3A BioNet, a large pan-African bioinformatics network of 28 institutions in 17 countries and heads the Computational Biology Division at the University of Cape Town. Her group provides bioinformatics services and develops new alg algorithms for the analysis of complex African genetic data. Please welcome Nicola Mulder. Good morning and thank you to the organizers of this conference and good morning to the uh, dignitaries and to the panel and the rest of the audience. So I'm pleased now to be able to talk to you about open science in Africa. So how are we enabling open science on the continent? So I'm going to talk, um, I mean, this audience is very familiar with open science and its advantages, but just as I'm one of the first speakers, just go over that a bit. Some of the challenges we have in open data in biomedical sciences in particular, and then how we've been addressing these challenges um, in H3 Africa and H3 Bionet. So H3 Africa stands for the Human Hereditary and Health in Africa. It's an initiative that was funded, uh, it's funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Wellcome Trust, now the African Academy of Sciences through AISA. And it was developed to enable the uh, study of the genetic and environmental basis for diseases in Africa. And these are all kinds of diseases that have a genetic basis. And then H3A Bionet is the Pan-African Bioinformatics Network, which was developed to build capacity to enable H3 African researchers to analyze the data on the continent. So I'm also going to touch on um, how we've been promoting open science on the continent and then think about some of our future activities. So open science is a movement. It's, um, it encompasses almost everything to do with science. So the data, the software, the methods, but also journals, review the review process. And in order to have open science, um, people engage with open science, we need to have a change in mindset. We need to have trust, we need to have transparency, and we need to have incentives for, for open science. So there are a number of advantages of um, open science, of openness and data sharing. So I'm going to be particularly focusing on biomedical data and, and the issues around data sharing. But many of the advantages include, obviously, that we have, uh, it enables reproducible science and increases the visibility and credibility of the data generators. And there's obviously providing opportunity then for additional publications and citations for those original um, data providers and data generators. In the genomic space, we need big sample sizes to make um, statistical inferences. So if you can share data across multiple cohorts, you get to increase the sample size and increase your power. And of course, what we find is that though some people generated data for a specific research question, many other people can bring new perspectives to that data and, and ask new questions of that data. Obviously, there are also new uh, discoveries that can be made that are relevant and, and benefit to participants. So if it can lead to new therapeutics or diagnostics, uh, as we've seen with COVID, the sharing of, of COVID data has, has helped to, to um, deal with a little bit of the surveillance and the outbreak response. And of course, it increases the value of the data, but also it's, it's now increasingly a funder and a general requirement to be open. So the number of generic challenges for dealing with the big data in general in the life sciences um, people in the life sciences tend to come, come from biological backgrounds. And the technical issues associated with data um, are not really taught in, in, the, in the biological sciences. So we have to think about data sharing, I'll come back to that, but data capture, transfer, storage, curation, analysis, interpretation, having the right tools to do this through proper visualization and, and finding the data, how to find um, the data sets that you need and integrate them. So we find that we're moving from a, um, many years ago where we were, we were data poor but information rich. Now we are, are data rich and information poor. So we need to switch that data to, to information and then to knowledge and to application. So in, if you look at low and middle income countries, obviously many of those countries in Africa, the number of, of um, IT barriers to sharing and data and openness 
So the first two sets I'm going to talk about are really related to the people who would be reluctant to share. And one of the reasons is because of uh, lack of data skills. So if you want to be able to exploit your own data before you share it with others, you have to be able to have the skills to analyze it first and fast. So you need the data processing, integration, um, and analysis and interpretation skills, which are lacking on the continent. We also have a limited access to computational resources, so to actually compute on the data and process that data. So we have only a handful of HPCs, um, serious internet challenges uh, through the, both the bandwidth but also electricity. Um, so having a regular reliable uh, electric supply for backup storage and processing and access to clouds is a challenge. And then of course with the data itself, the data is very heterogeneous. Um, we have differing different environments in which the data is collected and it's not necessarily well curated. So we need to have training in data curation analysis, we need technical infrastructure and we need to implement standards. So in particular biomedical data, I mean this is generic to, to all countries, you obviously have to worry about privacy, consent um, and, and sharing for, for clinical and human genetic data which even though it can be anonymized, genetic data is your, your identity. And then in African countries, we have a, had a history of vulnerable populations being exploited um, and what we call helicopter science, where then the African researchers are not um, engaged in that research themselves and do not benefit from that research output. Pathogen data or some of the other data, there's potential for discovery or commercialization, which people wouldn't want to lose. And then there are also the real challenges of data sharing policies and, and IREs. So a lot of the ethics boards um, are really new to the area of, of big genomic data sharing. And um, in many national laws, this is not even in the legislation about what are the, what are the, the country laws about moving genomics and uh, clinical data across borders. And then of course there's the skills and um, I think one of the biggest challenges for us though is the limited access to data from many regions. So to address this we, we're looking at ways to have a, a balance between protecting participants their privacy um, and their rights at the same time as not blocking access and, and scientific advances. We need to recognize the scientific contribution of those who um, generated the data and then we need to, to build the skills to enable um, the data generators, African researchers, to analyze the data. So we know that African data is very important. Um, we have a, a disproportionate burden of diseases. We need to share pathogen data because pathogens don't sit within borders, they cross borders as we've seen. Um, but also particularly in African, in human genetics. So African genomes are extremely diverse. They're the most diverse on the planet. And um, we have different susceptibilities to NCDs and infectious diseases through different evolutionary pressures that have occurred over, over the years. But the data are still globally relevant. So individuals of African descent are living all around the world. And um, obviously pathogens spread, but they're also variants and knowledge of African genomes which are informing the um, evidence for clinical actionability in other populations. So the biggest problem as I said is that African data are very underrepresented in, in um, public databases and Africans in, global, um, in the global arena. So the top map on the left just shows for example the COVID-19 host genetics consortium where you can see the participation in, from Africa is extremely low compared to you know, the highly clustered regions around Europe and, and North America. The map on the, on the bottom right shows the way the actual pathogen data coming out of these and that's a, a little bit um, more widespread. But when you look at other databases um, for, for human genomics data and these have been published several times, the representation of African data in these repositories is very low. So, um, you know, less than 10% compared to other, other world populations. So there's a problem not only of the access of, of how much data there is, but also finding the data. So in many cases, the coups, um, African scientists haven't necessarily had funding to generate the data sets. They are reluctant to, to put these out there in um, public repositories, so, so they're just not accessible. But also the data that is accessible is um, not as necessarily well labeled. Um, so for example, we've been trying to access and find African data. And in most of the places, Africa is just considered one country. It's just African, whereas in other, you know, in Europe, they just differentiate by country. Now Africa, the 
the, the genetic diversity on Af in Africa simply does not warrant even just regions, let alone um, a, a single continental description for a data set. And then obviously searching across multiple different sites is, you know, having to, to, to merge data later, it gets complicated. So what we've tried to do in, in HRA Bionet is to build some portals and catalogues to, to provide access to existing data that is generated within the consortium, which I'll talk about, but also to provide better access and curation for the data that's sitting in the public repository. We've also tried to um, implement standards, which I'll come back to. So it's been recognized, actually, even by the repositories themselves, that there needs to be a better framework for representing data in these repositories. And um, as I said, sometimes, um, mostly it's just African, but sometimes it's African versus European, sometimes it's black versus white. So the representation is not very good in terms of trying to find the data. So we've been working in Asia Africa and Asia Bionet on an ethnolinguistic ontology for African populations specifically. And this is both country and region based. And so you can browse the ontology by country. You can then find for a particular ethnic group information about the language, the ethnicity, and, and a little bit about genotypes. And then um, we also note that some of these ethnicities are linked to multiple countries. So we're trying to use this um, it's an linguistic ontology to better curate some of the data. So we've created, uh, we've developed an African microbiome portal, which aims to um, basically collect information and metadata about microbiome studies that have been performed in Africa. And so it looks at uh, the literature and it looks at public databases and then provides summaries for um, all, all of this data that comes from African studies. Because many of the studies are, that are in the literature are not yet in the public databases, we try to include um, the, the metadata from these individual papers. But we allow you to browse the study, the, these studies by study site, um, disease, etc. And then um, you can also just um, browse them by region. So you just click on the map and see which studies, uh, microbiome studies are in, this, in these regions. A similar portal um, we've developed is for African genomic medicine related activities. So here we've integrated data from uh, Farm GKB, Clinvark Engine, DisGeneNet to try to, so we're not trying to replicate those. We're just trying to um, point via APIs to those data sets and have them curated so that these are the African specific ones. So you can search by um, disease or variant or a particular African ethnic group. And then it returns information from these databases um, that provides um, some more information. Now we've had to, we wanted to do this, make this entirely automated, but it's had to be reasonably curated because of the um, the way it's been difficult to identify those data sets within these, these portals. And then, so that's the looking at external data. And then for the Extra Africa data itself, Extra Africa is generating data on, on up to sort of 90, 100,000 participants. And this is uh, phenotype data and then genetic or genomic data of various different types and across various different diseases and across various different projects. So um, early on in the consortium, sort of six, eight years ago, we developed a data sharing access and release policy that would, was cognizant of the fact that African researchers might need more time because of the resources to analyze and, and publish their data before international sharing, and also protecting the rights of participants who have been previously exploited um, and where there are sensitivities. So what HRA Bionet, my network, has been doing is trying to build the, the um, genomics and computing and bioinformatics infrastructure to facilitate all of this and to enable African scientists to work more openly, but also for the African data to then be more openly available for, for other scientists. So we've developed containerized workflows, support for data analysis. Um, I'll come back to some of these in, in a bit more detail. Um, so in terms of the computing infrastructure, we've set, up, we've set up some computing centers around the continent that have a reasonable capacity now to analyze data and also facilitating movement of data across, across the countries. We've developed reproducible workflows so that the data is, um, uh, the results are, are reproducible and can be shared. And then we've also got an archive for the African genomics data, not to serve the data, but really to act as a um, custodian of the data for submission to public repositories so that when it goes to the public repositories like the European Genome Phenome Archive or the ENA, then it's well curated and then it's um, interoperable with other data sets um, and easily findable. So 
We are trying very hard to work within the FAIR principles, the findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So we're doing this through um, having a searchable catalogue and curating the data. So some of these I'll go into in a bit more detail. So first of all, we're standardizing and harmonizing data. So all the phenotype data in particular, there's um, a lot of phenotype data that's been collected in very different ways. And so we're trying to, to work across the, con the cohorts to try and harmonize the data so that you can um, have method analysis across these data sets if you wanted to have open sharing of the data. So some of the work we've been doing in that space is building standard um, the modules for each different data types and then building REDCap templates to enable these to be um, put into REDCap databases and to generate standard case report forms for these. We also have um, curated all the, all the data to annotated the, the data to uh, existing ontologies where possible. And then the metadata has been made available in, for searching in the data, the Azure Africa Data and Biospecimen Catalog, where you can now search for which data sets or biospecimens are available <clears throat> by country, by disease, um, or by study. <clears throat> and then the catalog allows, um, provides an online access request form that then that goes directly to the Data and Biospecimen Access Committee for approval. We also try to implement GA4GH standards, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, to make sure that, the, that everything we do is, is of an international quality and interoperable um, internationally. And this is to also facilitate federated data sharing and federated data analysis, where data maybe cannot move across borders because of national laws. So the uh, key component is how do we ensure that our researchers have the skills and um, um, facilities to manage um, ana analysis of their own data and then standardizing and, and sharing of their data for open science. So we have a number of different training activities in s Bionet. Um, these are different modes. For our online courses, we've run introduction to bioinformatics, um, and genomic medicine courses where we reach um, over a thousand trainees at a time in our remote classroom model. But we also run face-to-face -face workshops um, and um, hackathons that enable researchers to actually do analyses and um, <clears throat> do co-development, collaborative development of tools and workflows. So we've also had a, a number of, of activities in, in promoting open science and participatory research and so building these collaborative things. As I said, the hackathons are one way of, of enabling researchers to come together and collaboratively analyze data or, or build tools. But we run open science cafes and discussions at conferences and um, some of our meetings where, where possible. And then we also a couple of years ago and then more recently have been doing some open science training. So for example, we had this East Africa open science tour where we taught um, a number of groups from different backgrounds on, on research workplace reproducibility, sharing data management plans, collaborative research, and tools and platforms for open science and collaborative research. So one of the things we're trying to do now is to build these open learning circles. So in our IBT is the big remote classroom bioinformatics training course that we run. And this basically has remote classrooms around the continent that are all linked at the same time, two hours, uh, two to four hours on two days a week for four months to learn um, about bioinformatics. So they have online lectures that are pre-recorded and then they all um, sort of team up together. So it's a networking opportunity as well as a learning opportunity. So what we're encouraging is for each of these classrooms when they finish the IBT course to then open an open learning circle. And this is then for them to, as a group, to go in and teach each other, share ideas, exchange um, skills and, and, and expertise. And so one of the things we've started implementing is we were offered, um, Sanger has got an online pathogenomics course. And so we've now putting this forward as an, as an opportunity for them to discuss and learn in one of their open learning circles. So some of the other ongoing work, um, we're a driver project for GA4GH, so we're continuing with those for implementing those standards. I'm also involved in the European Commission project called Sinica, and this is now trying to enable federated uh, data sharing and analysis across three continents, Europe, Canada, and Africa. And then we're also doing further training in data science. And then just to mention the African Open Science Platform, which has just um, been funded to be established at the National Research Foundation in South Africa, but it's an African platform and then a number of activities that they'll be uh, setting up to promote open science in Africa. So to conclude then, 
um, what are we talking about is, is how we've been trying to increase the findability and accessibility of African data. So this is not only for the African researchers, but also for um, global researchers who want to use this valuable data. And then it's, what's important to enable that is to develop the infrastructure to enable um, African researchers to analyze their own data, but also then to enable responsible access of others to the data, ensure tools can be moved to the data, and ensure, ensure that African scientists can compete in the data analysis international arena. So in trying to increase the usefulness of the data by um, sticking to the FAIR standards, providing training, um, and we're hoping that this will facilitate responsible open science and um, major African participation in this. So with that, I'd like to thank, um, sorry, just, just to say that we, yeah, it's, what's important here is equity versus equality to enable African scientists to participate and coming back to this mindset, trust and transparency and, and incentives. So I'd like to thank, um, just acknowledge the Estuary Africa and the Estuary Bionic Consortia, our funders, the National Institute of Health, and um, once again to thank the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you.